morning, everybody. I'm supposed to say that really loud, and I'm supposed to smile to you all, too. Can you imagine that, me smiling? All right, so I'm going to do that. So take a picture, because here I am. All right, again, welcome to our first ever program partnering with Memorial Healthcare Systems. Yes, MS Views and News partners with different healthcare systems around the country, so that way we can bring to the communities around and let them see what these MS centers have. So we're doing that. Today's program, like I said, is with Memorial Healthcare, and it's going to be a, a day filled of learning for you, so you get to hear you know, the different modalities or different disciplines of therapy that they have. For those that do not know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I, too, have multiple sclerosis, and this began long ago, and that's why you can ask me about it later on. In the back of the room, I want you all to see Jennifer Falk. She's responsible for a lot of the programs that we do, as she writes, like, all the grants that we do for all the different programs. And speaking about our grants, everybody, and the amount of programs we do, this year, 55 programs across the United States. 55 programs in 52 weeks. There's a lot of weeks that have doubled up, a lot of time on the road and far away. Again, how many are we doing outside the state of Florida? We're doing programs now in 23 states. 23 states, so that's a lot of crisscrossing around. And we're hitting California a few times this year. In fact, at the beginning of December, I'll be back again. It's big trips, big tiring things to do. Since we first began doing programs in February of 2010, we have now held over 310 programs. I can't say over 320, so I say over 310, okay? So that's a great thing, and again, the reason for this is people need it. We are now affecting thousands and thousands of people just from our educational programs, and again, like I mentioned before, social media, between Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, we are now bringing our information to over 50,000 people. Okay, over 50,000 see what we're doing every single day, and this is awesome. So now I want to introduce you to Memorial Healthcare System. So Memorial has multiple sclerosis and neurology center at Memorial Neuroscience Institute. The MS and Neuroimmunology Center is dedicated to providing advanced neurological consultation and extraordinary care to individuals with multiple sclerosis. They focus on all aspects of the disease, including diagnosis, clinical trials, brain imaging, and laboratory research. They strive to improve the health and hope of MS patients through advocacy, education, and advanced treatment and research. I would like you all to pay attention to the screen here as we have a 30 second video to show you. Barbara trusts Memorial Neuroscience Institute to care for her multiple sclerosis. She receives everyday extraordinary care and you can too, even for the most complex cases. The intensive focus of fellowship trained physicians and specialists, extensive testing and enhanced multidisciplinary treatment options means Barbara is back to living extraordinary every day. Make your appointment now at memorialneuroscience.com slash MS. Our next speaker is Dr. Ashwin Mehta, okay, and Dr. Mehta has a tough act to follow here as well. And again, I just want to let you all know again, this is not just an MS Views and News program, this is a Memorial Health system, and we want to thank them all for what they're doing today as well. So let me read to you about Dr. Mehta. Dr. Ashton Mehta is the Medical Director of Integrative Medicine and Memorial Healthcare System. He trained as a fellow in the program of Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. He is board certified in internal medicine and sleep, and his experience expertise includes nutrition, exercise, sleep, yoga, and mindfulness to achieve wellness in the context of treatment for MS. Dr. Mehta's research interests include the use of preventative medicine and positive health behaviors, behaviors to improve quality of life in patients being treated for chronic medical conditions. His team is comprised of experts in the complementary techniques, and they have developed innovative client-centered wellness programs aimed to enhance quality of life through the spectrum of care. Let's welcome Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon. Uh, thank you to Dr. Sube, to Stuart, and to everybody in the organizing committee 
uh, for, the, for their kind invitation to be with you all this, this afternoon. You know, um, we've, we've been at Integ Integrative Medicine has been at Memorial for about two years now. And over the course of those two years, we've been able to really win the hearts, minds, and trust of referring providers in a number of different subspecialties. So we see everybody from people who are referred from neurology, from cancer, from oncologists, from cardiologists. Um, and you know, the reason that we're here is because there's a lot more that we can do to empower our clientele. Those people who are suffering, all of us in this room who are suffering, you know, we need to do more to share with you the resources and tools that you can use on a daily basis to achieve better health, to achieve better quality of life. And that's really the goal and mission of integrative medicine at Memorial. So, you know, when I saw on the schedule that I was the third speaker, I kind of got a little nervous because, you know, you're about at the hour plus mark right now of being seated and you're at the very tail end of what is known to be our concentration window. So I'm going to share with you a little technique that, we, that I introduce to every single client who walks through the door. And I'd like it if, if I could just request you to put your fo forks down for just a second. Your lunch will be there when you open your eyes, okay? I promise. <laughs> but everybody just sit straight, check in with your posture, and we're going to do some really simple, deep breathing, okay? And enjoy a little moment of quiet reflection and deep breathing. So making sure the back is straight, ears are over the shoulders, shoulders are over the hips, and feet can be flat on the floor. You can close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And just take a few deep transition breaths. Remember, we're not trying to change anything or fix anything right now. We're simply noticing. Noticing the abdomen rise with each inhalation and noticing the belly subside with each exhalation. We may become aware of our heart rate slowing down and perhaps the speed of our thoughts and minds slow down for a bit as well. This is a gift. Just a few moments of quiet breathing. Good, now opening the eyes, coming back. Please enjoy your lunch. You know, we had time for that. We have time for that, partly because Dr. Cohen did such a great job of covering cannabis and medical marijuana in the context of MS, which, are gonna, which were my last three slides. So I figured I'd introduce a little bit of mindfulness. Well, every single client whom we, whom we see gets a prescription for mindfulness, meditation techniques, which include guided imagery, creative visualization, breathing techniques, fixed gaze meditations, all of these different types of techniques that we bring to bear in the context of engaging the power of the mind in the healing process. And that is very empowering. So my objectives briefly, um, this, over the course of the next 10 minutes or so, are gonna be to define what integrative medicine is, to describe the role of integrative medicine in the non-pharmacologic management of multiple sclerosis and the associated symptoms, to present the evidence for nutrition, physical activity, quality sleep, acupuncture, mindfulness, and even yoga for brain health. <clears throat> Many Americans, so what is integrative medicine? Integrative medicine is actually a very, very much a consumer-driven movement. It is your voice, your, your demanding these other approaches that has made hospitals and health systems listen in order to expand our toolkit when it comes to what kinds of things we bring to bear in 
treating multiple sclerosis and the associated symptoms. So many Americans, nearly 40% use healthcare approaches developed outside of mainstream Western or conventional medicine for specific conditions or overall well-being. That's quite a substantial number. Now, there's a lot of confusion regarding the terminology. What is integrative versus functional versus complementary versus alternative? Well, we never tell our clients to reject the wonderful scientifically proven gold standard of care, which is sound medical management using the highest technology that is involved with diagnostic techniques, um, imaging techniques, and perhaps even operatively some surgical procedures, which you're going to hear about later this afternoon, that may actually improve quality of life and symptoms in the context of MS. We never tell anybody to reject those things. However, in combination with those things, what you're eating and drinking on a daily basis, how much physical activity and exercise you're doing, your stress level, and how well you're managing your stress level, and how well you are developing strategies to better cope with the stress. Um, all of these things are incredibly important. Now, I got into this field from sleep medicine. Sleep is a surrender. Sleep is a letting go. So, so many of us are so aware of all of the wonderful things that we have to be doing, but what if I told you you can accomplish tremendous gains in your health by doing less? by slowing down, by relaxing a bit and getting good sleep, right? So that's the, sleep is very much a behavioral subspecialty and it, it grew my interest in integrative approaches because so much of what we do day to day, week to week, month to month, has a profound impact on our health, on our quality of life and how we feel in combination with medical management. So complementary generally refers to using a non-mainstream approach together, together with conventional medicine. So not only do we use uh, wonderful medications and procedures to treat the symptoms of MS, but we also would use acupuncture. We would also use therapeutic yoga. We would also re recommend nutritional practices and natural health products, other vitamins and supplements where there's a good evidence base to support their use. And that's a good example of complementary medicine or integrative approach. Alternative refers to using a non-mainstream approach in place of conventional medicine, which again, we do not recommend. Integrative medicine is very much a patient-centered approach. Patient-centered means the first question that we ask any client when they come through our door is, what are your goals? What are your top two health concerns? So instead of being a very prescriptive model, we're actually looking for our clients to tell us, what is it that you would like to achieve? What is it what are, what are your goals? And we customize and tailor an individualized approach that helps achieve those goals. It's very much a partnership in that way between provider and client. Now you notice I use the word client instead of patient oftentimes. And the reason is because integrative medicine applies very much a preventive model to achieve better health. So you can imagine that even before someone becomes a patient, We'd like to see them preventatively, proactively, in order to empower them with the, new, with, the, with the educational tools and resources that are necessary in order to be active participants in managing early disease process. So we span the spectrum from prevention to treatment. We use natural, effective, non-invasive interventions whenever there's good science to support their use. So we engage mind, body, spirit, and community. We encourage our providers to model healthy lifestyles for our patients. Our focus attention is on lifestyle choices for prevention and maintenance of health. And we maintain that healing is always possible, even perhaps when cure may not be. I'd like to introduce you to, this is the yellow emperor of ancient China, Huang Di, canon of Chinese medicine dated back to 2600 BC. Now he's often credited with developing the first healthcare system that is well documented. And in, in this healthcare system, you would pay your provider a stipend every single month. As soon as you fell ill, you'd stop paying them. So the focus was preventive. The focus was to keep you a happy, healthy, productive member of our society. And so we are actually reverting back to that in so many ways. Uh, thousands of years later. So oftentimes there's a real cluster, there's a, there's a constellation of symptoms that are interconnected, woven together, that we, that we oftentimes encounter 
in our clients who are living with multiple sclerosis. And these include fatigue, weight loss and weight gain, poor sleep quality, depression, anxiety, chronic headaches, neuropathy, pain, physical deconditioning, sexual dysfunction, constipation, all of these things can be very disabling. And oftentimes there, there's, there is, there's an interrelatedness between all, of these, between all of these entities. And what we see oftentimes, we categorize into different, into different broad categories. There's the inflammatory category, which is hot, which means we need to cool things down. Or there could be the atrophic category, which is cold, means we need to fire things up. There's the toxic category. This can be everything from food sensitivities to other environmental exposures, heavy metal toxicities. We evaluate for this. And then there's the vascular. So this is the pale, the pale category. There's the traumatic category and the sleepy category. So all of these are just, these are not really scientific terms, but these are kind of the, 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 the archetypes of MS that we oftentimes see. Now, what kinds of things do we do that is, a, that is sort of unique and apart from um, what might be considered standard of care in the context of our evaluation? And that is, we check for the glucometabolic reasons um, why somebody might have an underlying inflammatory or predisposing inflammatory condition. So we'll check a hemoglobin A1C. We'll do a, a sleep screening. We'll check for homocysteine. Homocysteine is oftentimes correlated with a higher degree of inflammation, as is highly specific CRP and other inflammatory cytokines. We often test for microbiomes and heavy metal toxicity. ApoE4 related to our, to our cholesterol and fat metabolism, uh, which is an allele that is very, very um, uh, predisposing to hyperinflammatory conditions, um, not just neurocognitive conditions, but also cardiovascular conditions. We aggressively screen for vitamin D deficiency and check thyroid function. We oftentimes do hormonal testing if we feel that might be of benefit, and we would also um, check a lipid panel. So this is the kinds of approaches that we use. Remember I said that there was a lot of interconnectivity in between a lot of these symptoms that are associated with MS. Well, we use a nutrition approach, so an anti-inflammatory nutritional approach. We encourage exercise because of some of the science that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. We, we, we share mindfulness techniques and prescribe meditation to every single client who walks through our door. Every, everybody's encouraged to sleep, to achieve better sleep quality. We use acupuncture. We have a wonderful team of acupuncture providers. Acupuncture has been shown to benefit for spasticity, the neurospasticity that you've been, that you've been hearing about earlier this morning. We use therapeutic massage, yoga, and then we have group programs like music and art therapy. And the goal is to really, really address this link between pain and inflammation, which are really two sides of the same coin. So let food be your medicine. This is so important, right? And what, what, do we, what do we focus on? There's a lot of compounds being studied now that are in, that are in foods that we eat that are, that are being looked at for their tremendous anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect. And this relates to brain health. What do we recommend? We recommend cruciferous vegetables. Um, these contain a class of ca compounds known as indo-3 carbonyls, very healing. Cruciferous vegetables include broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Asian mushrooms are a phenomenal category, um, and there, there are compounds like beta-glucans and AHCC being, being elucidated from these. Now, turmeric and ginger, the curcuminoids, also have a very tremendous benefit in terms of anti-inflammatory and um, anti-oxidant benefit. Same thing with the catechins in green tea. And as I said, we also really check for vitamin D, and we, we actually ensure that our vitamin D targets are super therapeutic from a, a level between 50 and 80 instead of 30 plus, which is what many, which is what we've historically reached for. So this is a really in, in, interesting study that was done in, in cancer survivors that's looking, at, that's looking at this relationship between poor sleep and cognitive slowing and how it improved with a therapeutic yoga practice. Now I'm gonna be a little short, I'm short on time, so I'm gonna breeze through some of these scientific studies very quickly. 
But suffice it to say that there's a really important relationship between sleep quality and cognitive functioning. So we always start with the slowing down, with the sleep, with the restful space, with mindfulness. And then we go move forward with exercise and nutrition and some of those other positive health behaviors that, um, that I've been uh, speaking to you about. Massage for fibromyalgia and sleep. So we use therapeutic massage as well. This was a study that looks at how fibromyalgia, actually this chronic pain entity, um, is, is improved by, as well as sleep quality improved with massage therapy. So how does acupuncture help? Well, this was a study from just earlier this year in February that was published in Neuroregenerative Regeneration Research that actually shows how modulatory effects of acupuncture on brain networks can Im help improve mild cognitive impairment in our patients. So exercise is medicine. You've understood, you've learned that, that movement actually is important when it comes to addressing spasticity and some of the other side effects of, of, uh, of MS. Multi this was a study that was published just last month that looks at the multimodal exercise training in multiple sclerosis. This was a randomized controlled trial in people with substantial mobility disability. And it involved 83 participants with significantly impaired mobility the, the, and the intervention included supervised multimodal exercise intervention, which included aerobic exercise, resistance, and balance. And after six months of this training program, there were significant improvements in six-minute walk performance and peak power output. So exercise is medicine, right? So we need to use exercise and nutrition in combination with the wonderful technologies that we apply in order to really gain the optimal benefit in terms of improving symptoms and enhancing quality of life. Now this is just a, a graph showing how many, mind, how many publications, how many research studies actually have the word mindfulness in the title from the year 1980 to 2013. So you can see that the science is now catching on. And it's really elucidating something that we all kind of understand and know intuitively, is that when we're stressed out, our health suffers, our health deteriorates overall. So mindfulness me meditation are simply techniques that engage the power of the mind in the healing process and help develop a skill set that helps, that helps cope with these types of stressful life events. Optimizing mindfulness-based stress reduction for people with multiple sclerosis, also recently published. This was um, a in very interesting study that found the participants in the mindfulness-based protocol, which was an eight-week mindfulness meditation course, they found that initially there was an unpleasant increase in awareness of disability, which was later then followed by greater acceptance and self-compassion. And other benefits from this eight-week intervention included improved relationships, improved walking, sleep, less stress, and less pain. So mindfulness actually changes brain structure. You can, you can, this was a study that looked at eight weeks of sustained practice of 27 minutes per day. Using mindfulness actually increased gray matter density in several brain regions. So mindfulness meditation, the simple practice of engaging the power of the mind in the healing process actually changes the very structure of the brain. Impressive. How does it work? Well, mindfulness modulates cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it also changes a lot of short-term gene functioning. This includes improvements in energy metabolism, mitochondrial functioning, insulin secretion, and telomere, and telomere maintenance decreased inflammatory response, and decrease in a cascade of stress-related pathways. So, fortunately, these are, all, these are all slides that were covered by Dr. Cohen. So I have the opportunity to kind of breeze through them and get to this very important slide. So, integrative medicine, because it's a partnership, it, 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 it actually, we encourage healthier doctors, healthier nurses, healthier individuals who are interacting with our clients in the healthcare system in order to, so self-care and self-compassion is at the very core of what we do. So this is where we're headed, um, to incorporating these positive health behaviors, not only for the clients whom we are caring for, but also for caregivers and also for the healthcare community at large. There's a lot of burnout, there's a lot of frustration, even within the medical field, right? Um, so this is, this is uh, we, have the, we have the distinct honor of participating in our physician wellness program, 
which imparts the same type of self-care principles that we share with our community to our physician workforce. And I'm going to close with this slide. This is from Daniel Siegel, the mindful therapist, published in 2010. And it's the rationale for our wellness model. Research suggests that our presence as medical or mental health clinicians, the way we bring ourselves fully into connection with those for whom we care, is one of the most crucial factors supporting how people heal and how they respond to our therapeutic efforts. And this speaks to the very essence of our integrative approach. Thank you so much. I, I, I neglected to bring my business cards like I was uh, reminded to do. Um, so if anybody would like to contact us, please take down this number and feel free to give us a call. Thank you for your attention, your wonderful audience. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. So again, we're going to do 10 minutes of Q&A, all right? And again, Jennifer's on that side, and I'm on this side. And we're going to start with that side of the room first, if you could get to this person over here. Do you offer all these testings in your practice? Not all. Not all. You know, it's a really individualized approach. See, when it comes to testing, oftentimes, unfortunately, the, the, the science that, 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 that justifies a lot of that testing isn't necessarily ready for prime time in the context of MS. Some of it is. So we take a very individualized approach. I mean, does everybody need a full microbiome analysis? No. But can we, can, we, can we safely conclude that most of us have a bit of bacterial dysbiosis or inflammatory leaky gut that may be contributing to some of the symptoms that we're commonly experiencing? Yes. So frankly, we don't really need to do all that much testing because it, nece it doesn't necessarily change our treatment. Everybody's going to get the same detoxifying probiotic type of nutritional recommendations that we, would, that, we would, that we would get based on a client's individual goals. Next question's here. I have two questions. Uh, first, does insurance cover your services? So, good question. You know, um, and the answer is sometimes. So, so you know, when it comes to, when it comes to our clinical consultation, you know, I'm a sleep medicine expert, so insurance companies see me, my, my sort of mainstream area of subspecialty in medicine is sleep medicine. So we talk a lot about sleep in our clinical consultations because it is sort of a central pillar of our integrative approach. And so we're able to, we're able to bill most insurance companies for the integrative medicine consultation because of that subtle nuance. Now, when it comes to acupuncture and massage, these are oftentimes out-of-pocket expenses that are, that are incurred by our clientele. Now, stay tuned, because at the end of the day, we're, medicine and healthcare is shifting to a fee-for-service, from, from a fee-for-service model where we get paid more for m the more we do, to a fee-for-quality model, and a fee-for-satisfaction, and a fee-for-outcomes model. So as we make that transition, insurance companies are going, to, are going to understand that if they actually fund acupuncture and pay for acupuncture preemptively and preventatively, maybe they can prevent a unnecessary hospitalization for nausea, vomiting, and dehydration. Right? So as these studies become, become more and more prevalent, uh, I expect insurance companies to follow suit and reimburse uh, increasingly for these types of modalities. And second, um, other than vitamin D, are there any other uh, supplements that you recommend for people with MS? So it's very, you know, I, 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 usually, I usually refer, I, I don't recommend blanket supplements, and I'll tell you why. Because oftentimes we have, to, we have to make sure the other medications that someone is taking, that there is no herb-drug interaction. So that's a very important um, aspect. And so it's a very individualized approach that we use. Um, we, we, we review an, uh, someone's um, current medication list and then judiciously apply natural health products in, in, in our approach. But again, food is medicine. So when it comes to foods, like the, some of the foods that I, that I described, you know, we encourage those wholeheartedly and without any re re reservations. A question here? Doctor, first of all, thank you for sharing the information you have shared with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Speaking of insurances, does your facility accept Medicare? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so in a just compounding everything small, uh, better living would be better uh, eating, more exercising, uh, a recording of your voice, and and then <laughs> and. The relaxation, right, doctor? So is that what you're recommending and then just let it go? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a very nice summary of, of, of my 20-minute of my talk. It could have been 30 seconds, see? Thank you. So fortunately, we do have the video recording of his voice, though. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Next questions over there. Any questions? If not, there are a zillion hands over here. Is a turmeric supplement as good as using the turmeric seasoning or whatever, like ginger? Can you use a supplement for the, it? You know, the idea, of the, the interesting thing about the curcuminoids in turmeric is that they're very poorly absorbed by our GI tract. So oftentimes what we recommend is when you, when you take turmeric in food, the absorption is actually better. There was, a, there was a, the ancient recipe from traditional Indian medicine, also known as Ayurveda, for turmeric was turmeric, black pepper, boiled in milk. So the, the curcuminoids are lipid soluble, so they dissolve in fat, hence the milk fat. And the piperine, the black pepper, the compound in black pepper, actually enhances the absorption of, of those curcuminoids into the digestive tract. So, you know, we don't recommend um, supplements for everybody, but having, having these healing foods in your daily, in your daily and weekly routine is, is, is of, of, of fundamental importance. Um, I know you talked about the importance of sleep. What's the recommended continuous sleep every night? So that's a great question. Um, you know, when, usually when people ask me that question, it, they're, what they're really asking me is, how little sleep can I get away with? Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, um, it, it, it's, it is very individualized. It's individualized because, you know, degree of stress, level of physical activity, all of these things play a part. In addition to that, physiologically, there are physiologically short sleepers, people who can get away with shorter durations of sleep, and physiologically longer sleepers. So there's no real set set time that, is, that it should be, that should be um, prescribed universally for everybody. Oftentimes, we, a lot of sleep experts used to do that, that you need seven and a half to eight hours of uninterrupted, consolidated, good quality sleep in order to be the best, you know, best performing person you can be. Um, but that's just simply not true. Um, so at the end of the day, there's two major questions that you need to ask yourself. On most mornings, do you wake up feeling refreshed? And do you have enough energy to get through the day without feeling like you're really dragging? And if the answer is yes, you have enough energy and you wake up feeling refreshed on most mornings, then you don't, you don't need, we don't need to go any further into the sleep medicine area. However, if the answer to one of those or both of those is no, then it warrants a di further dialogue about quality of sleep. Oftentimes our misconceptions about sleep fuel our anxiety about sleep. And that's exactly what we want to erase. So it's a good question, but it, again, it's a very individualized and tailored approach. Yeah, hi. I've been searching for a functional medicine doctor for a while. I haven't found any on insurance. you have any advice? You know, there aren't that many on insurance. Um, you know, functional medicine doctors um, are, 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 are very many different types of training. Um, so it's very, you have to be very careful. Um, and, and finding one that, is, that, that accepts insurance for all of, their, all of the, the modalities that they use is incredibly difficult. Functional medicine does utilize a high level of testing. And a lot of that testing is certainly not covered by insurance. So we cut out a lot of the testing piece because we know that the testing isn't really going to make much difference with regard to our treatment recommendations. So that's why we use a more integrative approach. Integrative medicine and functional medicine are very similar, um, but not that there are very few providers local regionally. So I appreciate your, your, your challenge. Okay, we only have time for two more questions. And unfortunately for others, I already have the two hands that were raised. Uh, I've heard or read so much recently about um, proper eating, whether it's MS, Alzheimer's, so many diseases. Are you recommending that we eliminate as many carbs as possible? And then my other part of that question is, because fruits have so much sugar, 
which can affect the brain also, should we be watching the amount of fruit we eat? Very good question. So there's two different types of carbs. There's complex and simple carbs. Now, if you really want a shortcut to an unhappy brain is to starve your brain of what its preferred, me uh, preferred metabolic fuel source, which is carbohydrates. So ultimately, we need complex carbohydrates in our nutritional routine. Carbs are not the enemy, folks. Um, simple carbs, however, convenience foods, processed foods are. So it's really easy. My nutritional recommendations can be boiled down in 10 words. Less meat, teat, wheat, and sweet, with teat being dairy, wheat being processed grains, sweet being refined sugars, more roots, fruits, leaves, and flowers. Roots, carrots, beets, turnips, radishes, ginger, turmeric, fruits to your heart's content, leaves, spinach, green tea, kale, and flowers are the cruciferous vegetables, right? That's your broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, and such. So if you, if you, if you actually reduce those pro-inflammatory foods, being meat, dairy, processed grains, and refined sugars, and increase your plant-based foods, you're on the right track. Oh, hi, doctor. Hello. Um, thank you for being here today again. I just wanted to clarify, perhaps I missed it. You said that um, you take Medicare, or at least your practice does. Our health I, system, our health system does. Okay, so how do we go about it if we want to have a sleep study or try out this integrative medicine with you? Do we go to our neurologist? Do we go to our PCP? Do we ask for a referral? I mean, how does that work? Most people self-refer. Um, we, we, we have a wonderful collaboration with our neurology and physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians at, at, at Memorial. So if you're already seeing them, it's, it's fair to just let them know that you, you're interested um, and then just give us a call. So it's actually quite um, a lot simpler um, than, than, and than we often imagine. And everybody doesn't need a sleep study. So we actually do a comprehensive sleep screening and then evaluate whether sleep uh, uh, study is warranted. Again, thank you so much for your attention and I can take some of the other questions offline. All right, let's give another round of applause to Dr. Mehta. That was a great talk. <laughs>